<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hope people are still gone. <laughs> Honest, honestly, you know, it's fine, fine with me. It's a, it's a, a great, a great time to put this experience, last four-year experiment behind us. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> Honest, honestly, you know, it's fine, fine with me. Uh, so we were starting you know, a few minutes. Uh, I think people are usually late, so they were drawn sure. later. Yeah. I think the, the inauguration actually is uh, at uh, noon your time, right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. It, it hasn't started. So I think people, will rush to, to watch the inauguration after your talk, <laughs> not, not before. Right, but you know, the drama, I'm sure that it's on live now. I'm sure people, <clears throat> people arriving and uh, getting caught up in the uh, Potomac fever, as they say. Hey, Tom. Ah, good morning. <clears throat> Hi, Sabir. See you too. Good morning. Hello, Sabir. Hi, the XA Tom. Good morning. The dimension and the inner products. And if you were able to do that, so take your. Morning, Tom. Good morning, Doug. Thank you. I hope you've uh, uh, resolved the power issues. We've ours just <laughs> resolved last night. We we did finally. So you got some competition, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, in fact, you know, I don't mind if people want to look at it out of the corner of their eye. That's fine with me. But but please, if the capital starts going on fire or something bad happens, don't don't tell me. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Hello, Tom. <clears throat> yeah, I guess we can start now. So there are already many people. Uh, Tom, are you ready? I am ready, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first uh, seminar this semester on HTC. Uh, today, it's our great honor to have Professor Tom uh, David Rocks as our first speaker for this semester. Uh, and uh, thank everyone for coming in this special day. I uh, hope you will not be distracted during the talk. Uh, so Tommy is a professor uh, at Stanford. He has many positions, as you can see in the <laughs> slide. Uh, Tommy is currently the director of the Stanford Institute for Material and Energy Sciences. Uh, he is also a professor of material science and engineering and a faculty at the Slack National Accelerator Lab. Uh, Tom has been focused on quantum matter theory and especially uh, uses a numerical method to study quantum matter. Uh, today he will tell us uh, the recent uh, efforts in numerical studies of HTC corporates. Uh, welcome Tom, Tom, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, you inviting me. 
to give uh, give a give a talk, and it certainly is a, a wonderful day already with the inauguration. Uh, and uh, I hope I can entertain you before the big event, which happens later later today. Um, it's really great to be part of this uh, this, this series. Uh, and that is sort of continuing with these wonderful talks that preceded me. I'm going to address the, the issue of whether the Hubbard model can be considered or to what extent it can be considered the equations that we would like to solve to describe the rich and uh, wonderful phase diagram of the Kupritz. So the uh, bad news is that uh, it's a tremendous job to be able to cover all of this material uh, and uh, uh, but the good news is, of course, the wonderful group of speakers that went ahead of me covered a lot of material that uh, will free me up. So uh, doesn't mean that none of these topics are important. It's just given the length of time, I won't be talking about um, some things uh, that represent great progress in the last decade or so, um, like perturbative treatments or DMFT and cluster variants thereof, uh, variational methods, vector field theories, topological states, all of this will not be uh, discussed during the talk, although I'll try to allude to them when, uh, when appropriate. Um, but what I'm going to, to uh, try to reflect upon is the progress that's been made uh, about understanding just how uh, difficult this problem is of trying to do our best to understand and solve with unbiased methods what, what uh, are, of course, the ground state of the Hubbard model, but what also are its properties at elevated uh, temperatures and how can we approach uh, the different regions of the phase diagram with doping and, and temperature and how do the parameters, uh, of course, here it's uh, very simple, the number of parameters are very small, but uh, uh, how does quantum chemistry play a role in determining the, the physics of the, uh, of the Hubbard model and does that have mapping onto the Kupritz? And so these are two uh, very important papers. I believe that they, they do uh, highlight the essence of uh, um, the problem, uh, the numerical problem, is that the, the first is that there are, are many competing ground states, uh, ground states which are very, very close uh, in, in energy um, on the order of uh, one over a, a hundred of the, the hopping or even smaller. And so that means that there's very strong tendency to tip the balance one way or another, depending upon things that you would like to try to minimize like effect of cluster size or, or uh, uh, being able to extrapolate to the thermodynamic limit. And as a result, it's been very difficult to be able to, to ascertain just a simple question of whether superconductivity in, in any particular form lies as a uh, true ground state or a valid ground state of the Hubbard model, at least in some particular limits, uh, certainly in the limit of U being small, that's one where we can definitively say something. But the talk that I'm gonna focus, this talk is gonna be uh, out of that limit of looking at when we do not have a small parameter to expand upon. So looking on the order, when U is on the order of the uh, bandwidth. So I would say that the, the evidence is there, there are many, many competing states, but the evidence that superconductivity is robust over all the other, other orders is uh, uh, something that there has been quite a lot of evidence uh, accrued over the last few years, but it's something that I want to highlight during this talk. Okay, and uh, as I said, there have been many advances in, in uh, proposed solutions of the Hubbard model, as well as numerical uh, techniques. And, and, uh, and as I said, we have heard quite a bit about a lot of these uh, 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 methods in different contexts, but in deference to all of the work that's, that's happened, I will just focus on our recent progress on looking at what I call brute force attempts at unbiased simulations. In particular, that means I'm gonna focus on DMRG uh, efforts which work at zero temperature and uh, determinant quantum Monte Carlo working at finite temperatures and show you how far one uh, can get based on, on work that has been done over the uh, several decades. So um, here is the problem that we're dealing with, the, the numerical challenges 
uh, and where a lot of the algorithmic advances have been made uh, in the last decade or so. Of course, these algorithms have been around for quite a while. Uh, and they, they uh, suffer in, in two important ways. Uh, one is the well-known fermion sign problem. Uh, this is shown on the left-hand side, which is the uh, average sign plotted as a function of uh, filling or doping on a uh, eight by eight lattice for different values of inverse temperature beta. Um, and uh, you see that when the average sign uh, uh, <clears throat> gets down to 10 to the minus three, that, that means you have to work a lot harder. It doesn't mean that you can't get any good data. It means that you have to accumulate many, many, many measurements to deal with the sign being that small. And so uh, this has always been the case, but uh, now of course we can increase the amount of measurements that we do. Um, and so everything that I'm going to be showing, showing you is based on, on 10 to the eighth or 10 to the 10 uh, measurements per simulation to be able to deal with the small value of, of the sign. And it's, of course, a well-known problem that the sign is worst exactly where you want to put your efforts on, right around what would be nominally optimally doping or 80, 85% filling. Um, on the uh, other side, of course, DMRG uh, is unbiased and, and asymptotically exact uh, uh, as well has a, a limitation of trying to extend to dimensions greater, greater than one. That's uh, both of these techniques suffer from the exponential complexity that, that one has in this problem. Um, and, but here is an example of, of keeping the, uh, a large enough amount of states when one does the uh, DMRG convergence to make sure that you are getting to properties of the ground state that you know that they should have in this case, SU2. Uh, symmetry. In some cases, it works very, very well. And in other cases, the number of states that you need for a given level of convergence has to get increasingly uh, large. And this gets worse as you increase the dimensions of uh, the number of, uh, of leg ladders, for example, that you want to try and simu simulate. So some advantages there uh, is to be to write the, write the code that respects some of the symmetries that, that it should be employed like SU2 and take advantage of just some simple block, spot, block sparsity uh, to um, make your, the calculation at least be able to handle more states than you might normally would have uh, a decade or so uh, ago. So I'm not going to discuss really more than this in terms of what's been done in terms of the uh, algorithm. I think that there's nothing, um, there's nothing that complicated uh, here. It, that's why I mean what I mean by brute force, keeping large number of states or taking a, a large number of measurements to be able to get controlled, uh, controlled answers. Okay, so this is the methodology uh, of what we want to try to, to do. As I said, these algorithms go back very long uh, in time. It's still the same algorithm that we use, for example, in Quantum Monte Carlo. But what we want to do is we want to look at the similar uh, clusters, similar parameters, similar shape of clusters, um, to look at a comparison between the physics one obtains from zero temperature or finite temperature calculations and to be able to ascertain, does, does this give us <clears throat> a good description of what we, uh, what we know the cuprits to be? So uh, I'll try to give you parameters of when I'm talking about uh, different uh, band Hubbard models, like in this case, a three band Hubbard model or single band Hubbard, Hubbard model. But um, as, as we go, I think it'll be, be clear that actually these two methods really do give the same physics. Okay, so this is the outline of the, of the talk. Um, the first part, I'm just going to be discussing <clears throat> the quantum chemistry of the Kruppitz, just how we get to the Hubbard model and uh, what are important steps that we need to think about as we go along the way. Uh, and really the bulk of the talk will be about the second topic, which is search for order in various different uh, uh, contexts. Uh, and then I'll close uh, given uh, that there is enough time to discuss transfer properties that are very easy for experimentalists to measure, but very difficult for uh, numerics to calculate. 
Okay, so uh, this is just an entry point. I think that this is well known in, and our community that in transition metal oxides, <clears throat> there's two flavors that we would think about in terms of uh, the parent compounds uh, being insulators. Uh, the energy scales are the charge transfer energy to put uh, uh, an electron uh, from the ligand onto the transition metal and the Hubbard U that characterizes the uh, ionization energy on this, the ele electron affinity to create a DN ground state and to, to DN, uh, DN minus one to DN plus one. And the categorization is just basically whether U and Delta uh, flip, flip uh, priority. If U is greater than Delta, then that is the uh, uh, panel B here, the charge transfer uh, insulator case, which is where the cuprates lie but it could be the other way around where the ligands are so far down that they don't play really a role in the physics near the Fermi level. And so we're then that's a Mott Hubbard insulator where a gap is controlled by the, the value of the, of the Coulomb U. So uh, the cuprates, as I mentioned, are, are uh, well known to be in the second case, but it's interesting um, just as, a, uh, 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 as an uh, aside um, to, think about the monovalent nickelates where the uh, nominally nickel two plus can be reduced so that it, instead of being a 3D8 spin one uh, system as it is in most nickelates uh, by uh, this topodactic reduction, it turns out to be uh, mostly D9. Um, so we would think it would be uh, more akin to the physics of the cuprates and that's why it was very exciting that when doped off of its weakly insulating parent phase at superconductivity was recently found with strontium doping on the order of 10 with the TC on the order of 10 Kelvin uh, or so. But, uh, uh, oops, have a typo here. But anyway, uh, uh, the, um, oh, that makes me worried that I have the wrong fig file. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Uh, but I think as pointed out by, by uh, Warren Pickett a uh, long time ago, the nickel one plus is not similar to copper two plus, at least in the, the lanthanum nickel O2, in the sense that the oxygen lies at much deeper binding energy. Uh, the charge transfer uh, uh, or the oxygen is uh, roughly on the order of four to six electron volts below the Fermi, Fermi level. And the Hubbard U is, is uh, Maybe on that order, or even less than that. So that's more on the uh, more like a, a mod insulator. But interestingly, um, that there may be charge transfer that that can be involved, but it's not with the ligand. It involves the uh, rare earth that there is a big one a orbital sticking out of the plane, uh, three a uh, five d z squared. Um, uh, orbital that may be involved in the physics close to the Fermi level. And that's been an exciting area that maybe indicates that the nickelates may be not the same as the cuprates. Um, but that's not the topic uh, of this talk. So going back to the case for the, the cuprates, if we stick at half filling uh, the antiferromagnetic insulator, the numerics is a really, does a really good job of nailing this problem. We have no sign problem at finite temperatures. Uh, and so that enables us to, to really explore uh, the nature of the high temperature to low temperature uh, evolution of the, of the states as well as the dynamics. And the bottom line is that this is really well described by Heisenberg-like models. That's a Nayel antiferromagnet with spin moment uh, that's reduced by quantum fluctuations, but not like RVB. Um, the uh, Heisenberg model does a very great job of describing the magnon dispersion, uh, uh, the night shift, NMR relaxation rate. Um, uh, I would say pretty much flawless, flawless, flawlessly. Um, and if we look at the, uh, the results uh, compared to spectroscopy, we can pin various different parameters that enter into our, our Hubbard model. So, there's the optical uh, from the optical conductivity. This gives us uh, uh, an uh, estimate for the charge transfer uh, <clears throat> energy. The value of the magnon uh, dispersion gives us an estimate for the super exchange J. Uh, the crystal fields have been measured uh, with great accuracy using uh, X-ray uh, uh, techniques. And uh, also the, the so-called 6E V peak is well understood from 
X-ray uh, as well as, as arising from a charge transfer um, um, excitation. And this gives us our nominal parameter set that U is on the order of the, the bandwidth, uh, meaning that it is in an intermediate coupling regime, not small, much smaller or greater than the bandwidth. The charge transfer energy is somewhere around two to three electron volts. J, this gives a pretty decent value of J of 100 or so milli electron volts, giving a hopping of about a quarter or a third of a volt. Um, so these are the parameter sets that uh, I'm going to be working with uh, and, uh, uh, and not going to be reporting what happens when you go outside of these limits in any strong, strong direction. So then if we dope away from half filling uh, for uh, three band uh, uh, DMRG and three band quantum Monte Carlo, we have uh, the results that we would, would expect that if we look, these are plots of hole doping and uh, for DMRG, the expectation value of uh, the spin. Um, when holes are doped in, they go predominantly on, on oxygen or a little go on, on copper. So grading some 2P5s. And if we dope with electrons that they go on uh, mostly on copper and creating detents. And uh, of course, uh, this is determined largely by the parameters that I showed in the previous, uh, previous slide. Um, and if we look at uh, one of the characterizations of these charge transfer insulators or, or what's been called motness, that there is a transfer spectral weight that occurs when one dopes, so not over just at the Fermi level, but over large energy scales on the order of uh, U. This is something that's been pointed out a long time ago, and you can see this very beautifully in uh, oxygen um, X-ray absorption, where this pre-peak at low energies piles up as one dopes in holes. This forms the so-called Zhang-Rai singlet peak, and rather than just changing one state, when one dopes into the lower, lower Hubbard band, you pull a state out of both the lower Hubbard band and the upper Hubbard band. And so the spectral weight transfer should go like 2x as x gets small. And if you look at that integrated intensity of the uh, uh, XAS low energy peak, you see that it goes like two times the doping uh, until on the order of about 20% or so when it has a changeover in slope that it looks like it's going more to what you would expect to just go linearly uh, with the uh, withhold doping. And uh, the other signature uh, uh, from the numerics is of course that this, this transfer of intensity occurs over large energy scales. And you can see that very clearly when one looks at photo emission um, so uh, on the left-hand side is the, uh, the insulator where you have a gap at half filling, the lower Hubbard band prominent at momentum zero zero and the upper Hubbard band prominent at momentum pi pi. And uh, uh, in between uh, a quasi-particle band that approaches the Fermi level, but is gapped out. And that quasi-particle band when dope crosses the Fermi level and steals intensity both from the lower and upper Hubbard band when one dopes either with holes or with uh, electrons, as you can see on the, uh, the plots, two plots on the right-hand side. So although spectral weight is still being transferred out when 16% holes or electrons are, are doped in, the upper and lower Hubbard bands are still clearly visible. So the physics of correlation is still there uh, and spectral weight transfer is still important over large energies at these, uh, at these dopings. Um, and then just moving to magnetism, going away from half filling uh, for, for both three band and single band. Uh, uh, this is just looking at the structure factor on copper of a momentum pi pi as a function of doping uh, for um, uh, different, different temperatures uh, on the left-hand side. And you could see a very uh, strong peak at half filling corresponding to the antiferral magnet, which is increasing as system size is increasing. And then it drops away uh, differently, whether one hole dopes or, or electron dopes, that's a particle hole asymmetry uh, uh, that occurs coming off of half filling. Um, and if you look at the uh, real space correlation, uh, that's uh, S, S of uh, R at different coppers, 
and you look at the uh, sign of that as a function of, of doping between, for nearest neighbors, it's R of one zero or next nearest neighbors one one, that um, of course that is uh, um, negative at uh, uh, half filling, but then uh, when one dopes, one can see that, that uh, there is a sign change that occurs and that's because that the correlations, uh, the magnetic correlations tend to become ferromagnetic as one gets to larger doping. And of course, I'm showing you here doping ranges which are well beyond what we normally think of in the cuprates, but I'm just showing you the full range from the empty band to the full band. Okay. Um, and if you look at calculations for S of Q and omega, the dynamical structure factor, which is plotted here, the quantum Monte Carlo, um, two things happen. Half filling is N equals one. So if you want to start, let's see if my little mouse works here. I don't know if you can see it, but started here, that's half filling. So you see you have bright uh, intensity at low, en low energies at pi pi corresponding to the uh, antiferromagnet magnet and the peak at, at uh, pi over two and at pi zero, the top of the magnon band. And if you look down here at pi pi, if you dope, then um, the uh, spin gap develops. So the intensity of the, of the peak uh, comes down uh, differently if you dope with holes or dope with electrons and the energy of the spin gap increases with, with doping until around 60%. It's on the order of T or so and the intensity is gone. Um, and uh, if you look though at the zone boundary, say at pi, pi zero, if you dope with holes, you see that this blue dot, which is just plotting the maximum of the peak, of the, uh, uh, sorry, maximum of the spectra, doesn't really move very much with hole dope and evening out to 60%. And there's a slight intensity decrease, um, but it's not as prominent as one sees out here, out at pi pi pi. And importantly, even, but the uh, uh, counter is when you dope with electrons, in fact, this blue dot is at larger energies than this blue dot. So as if uh, magnetism increases when one dopes uh, by 15% hole dopes, doping. And so these two things have been really uh, 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 verified in resonant and elastic X-ray scattering measurements with cross polarizations. And here's a plot just of that magnon uh, intensity uh, or power magnon intensity as a function of, uh, of doping for different materials. And you see it's relatively pinned. It stays on the order of uh, 2J or so when one dopes in a, a, a sufficient, I'm sorry, I didn't put the values in for the doping, but there's different samples that are listed here. Um, and as I said, it's well known that spin gap and the uh, suppression of spectral weight at pi pi has been known for a very, very long time. Okay, so in terms of this part of the quantum chemistry, um, I think the behavior of, of the parent material is very well uh, understood uh, in terms of a charge transfer antiferromagnetic insulator. Comparing with experiments gives us a parameter regime to, to work with. And there's really no inequivalence between one, one sees in three band uh, versus single band Hubbard models, uh, except if anything, you have a, a question about the role of oxygen or behavior at high energy spectroscopy like the 6EV peak and these sort of things. Um, and looking at uh, just doping away from, from half filling, the role of correlations are certainly important even over a large range of, of doping in terms of the Hubbard bands and spectral weight transfers and the persistence of uh, local antiferromagnetic correlations, uh, the persistence of these paramagnons that one can see. So I would say that this is an over, overall good description of the magnetic properties uh, of the of the cuprates. Um, so uh, I want to go into the second uh, uh, part of the talk, which is discussing all of the putative orders that is uh, that have been discussed in light of the cuprates. But maybe I'll, I'll pause here and just ask if there are any questions about the previous previous part. Okay, I see a raised hand. Uh, can you say a few words about whether, um, um, so the starting model has um, charge conjugation symmetry, right? But then the plots that you showed seem to be different for electron hole doping. Could you say a few words about that? 
Yeah, sorry. So, uh, of course, in the three-band Hubbard model, that, that's not the, the case because of the, the uh, position of the ligand. So the oh, particle hole asymmetry is a single band Hubbard model at half filling. Sorry, I should have uh, should have rephrased that more clearly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, or shall I go on? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to first talk about what I think most people have, have uh, discussed uh, in, this, in this series, which is results from DMRG. And, and there's been tremendous amount of work that's been done uh, where stripes are, are showing up uh, very clearly, starting from the beginning at hartree fock mean field down to variational quantum Monte Carlo and uh, minimally entangled uh, thermal states. Uh, the presence of uh, the modulation in the spin structure factor is very clear. That's starting from the antiferromagnet. Here's three, three band. Uh, that the uh, peak in the S of, uh, S of Q splits off of pi pi to uh, in, in um, magnetic incommensurate value, uh, which is set uh, by the doping. And so um, if you plot here are some results, I'm going to highlight these. Yeah, this is an older version of the talk. Oh, well, okay. Highlight these papers that I list down at the bottom here uh, and just show you the plot of the, the density here on the left-hand side. Electron density is a function of position. And look at first the case when T prime can be set to being roughly zero and U on the order of 12T, and this is at a doping of one over eight. So there's a very clear modulation in the charge density, and the period of the charge density is just uh, period eight, it's set by, by the uh, um, one over the, the whole doping. Um, and uh, if you look at the spin-spin correlation function, you find that it of course oscillates uh, and changes sign. This is the antiphase domain wall, and it has a wavelength, which is twice that of the, of the charge stripes, but and it exponentially decays with distance as opposed to the charge density uh, wave and the correlation length being on the order of uh, uh, six to eight uh, lattice constants or so. So, um, and if you look at the superconducting correlations, so looking at delta, uh, delta expectation value, um, plotted as a function of uh, distance down the, the chain um, as a function of R. This is plotted on a log linear plot so that this is an exponentially uh, decaying um, superconducting correlation that goes along with the exponentially decaying spin uh, uh, correlations. So meaning that uh, superconductivity decays exponentially in this case when you have period eight stripes um, and uh, there's a, a recent plot that shows if you put on a pair field, this H of, H of P to induce an order as that pair field is turned off, the induced order also turns off consistent with that this particular case, there is no long range uh, superconducting order. Um, and I think uh, though a lot of emphasis has been put on the role of T prime. And in fact, it's one of the, the strongest parameters that can change the behavior of the order. Um, so above is the period eight stripes that one gets is T prime of equal to zero. Here's the different value of U of U equal uh, eight. Um, and then when uh, one puts on a T prime here, T prime is minus a quarter. Um, you can see right away that the period is halved. Uh, so one goes from filled stripes, all the holes being on the stripes, to half filled stripes of being distributed with twice the uh, dis or the half the distance between them. But also importantly is the amplitude of the charge density modulation comes down as well. Um, and uh, if you then look at the superconducting uh, uh, correlations, again, delta delta dagger for distances down the, down the chain. Now this is on a log log plot and you could see for, for uh, different values of, of doping that it decays as a power law rather than exponential. In both TJ and in, in Hubbard, there's two values of U on the right-hand side. 
And it's D-wave-like, meaning that the, the, cor the, the, bon the bonbon correlations change sign under a rotation of 90 degrees. Of course, the, the cylinder, of course, breaks C4, but uh, so it's not truly D-wave that in that sense, but it's uh, D-wave-like in that there's a change of sign. And if you fit the power law decay, you can define an exponent Ksc for how quickly the, uh, the correlations die off as one of, as one of the distance. Um, and if you plot both the exponent that you get from fitting the charge order, which is long range or decaying uh, uh, as a power law, and the superconducting uh, uh, exponent, you find that the product of these two exponents is one. For different values of, of doping, here's 1 over 8, 1 over 10, 1 over 1 over 12. Uh, this is for u equal to, to uh, uh, u equal to 12, 12 t. So this is the, what uh, one has uh, identified long time ago as a Luther Emery liquid, that charge in order and superconducting order are dual to each other with the product of the exponents being pinned at one, corresponding to a single gapless mode in the central charge. So that you can get by looking at the entanglement uh, entropy and you find that uh, C is uh, a one plus a little bit of error for a range of doping uh, around half filling from one over 12 to one over one over eight. Uh, and in fact, you can show as you change doping or change T prime that the filled stripe state, the non-superconducting filled stripe state gives way after a period of, uh, of uh, uh, phase separation to a large region that is this Luther Emery uh, uh, liquid, which is characterized by having half-filled stripes and long range, uh, quasi long range, or best as you can in, in quasi one dimensional charge uh, density wave order and, and superconduct or, order core with a sizable uh, spin gap. And uh, this has, uh, uh, has recently been looked at by uh, other groups as well, so, uh, uh, which is a slide that somehow didn't appear here. Um, but we have some issues uh, with these results. It's certainly encouraging that it's going in the right direction, but you could ask uh, the two following questions. So I've shown you that it changes, the, the order parameter changes uh, or the correlations change sign under rotation within the cylinder of uh, 90 degrees, but you can ask, well, what about C4 symmetry going around the cylinder, meaning uh, wrapping around the cylinder, which is what A and B is shown. Um, and so it fi we, we find is that DMRG favors this uh, more one dimensional flavor of true D wave going around the cylinder. It fits perfectly actually that it's a plus minus going uh, around the, the outside of the cylinder, which is not what you would, would like to see in, uh, in more of the 2D case. You would see something that would look more like B, which is uh, uh, D-wave-like going uh, uh, down the, the length of the cylinder, meaning that for C4 rotations uh, around the cylinder, one's positive and the one's negative. So uh, of course, this is uh, maybe a, just a, a, an artifact of four leg Hubbard ladders. Uh, and uh, we really would like to get a, a better feel for this for six leg. And there's been some results that have started to appear or older results on six leg ladders and newer results that are starting, starting to appear. So this is an open question. Um, uh, and then the other is if you look at different values of U, uh, for U of eight or U of, of 12, you find that the superconducting cor correlations uh, drop off faster for larger U. Um, and uh, that's also uh, shown in this figure from this other paper, um, which again, that U of four seems to be, have a stronger tendency to superconductivity than U of eight. And uh, the DMR, uh, DMRG that uh, showed in the, in the upper, uh, gray gray area shows that the correlation lengths are, or at least, or the correlations are dropping off faster for larger U. So this is going to be the question of whether or not in the region where we would like to see that we have enough superconductivity, even in the case where we see long range superconducting order. And I'll come back to this. So going to finite temperatures then uh, into quantum Monte Carlo, 
One can look at the, uh, the similar evidence for, for stripes. This is looking at SISJ or the spin-spin correlation function. So you can see up here in the upper right-hand corner at half filling, it's plus minus, plus minus going along the, from the reference spot here at zero, meaning it's a, an antiferromagnet with some finite correlation lengths because we're at elevated temperatures. And if we plot the sublattice magnetization, just flipping the spin at every other site, then you see you just have a nice uh, uniphase uh, antiferro magnet. But then when one, one dopes, one could see that the uh, correlation length changes a little bit, but you get still persistence of uh, local magnetic, antiferro magnetic order, but there is a domain wall in which the antiferro magnetic order flips its phase. Um, and these green lines denote that uh, domain boundary, and you see that the, the width between the two domains is shrinking as one dopes, even up to 20, 21% or so. Um, so that's uh, uh, evidence for uh, fluctuating spin stripes. But if we look at the charge in the same light, we do not see any evidence at these temperatures for charge fluctuating charge order. So, and this occurs as long as one gets to temperatures below approximately about, about J. And we've pushed to go to lower temperatures, but still no sign of charge order. Um, but what we do see is a very strong dependence on T prime in the sense that both the, the stripe period can be changed as well as the overall strength of the spin-spin uh, correlation function. So T prime being negative will have a tendency to reduce the period of the, the, of the stripes and T prime being positive will increase the period of the stripes and make it be on the order of the, of the cluster. So this is consistent uh, also with what, what comes uh, uh, for zero temperature in, in DMRG. And if you plot this incommensurate spin incommensurability as a function of, of doping, the simulations are, uh, can be looked at from either real space momentum space cuts, so MDC or EDC to determine that value. And that's plotted along with, uh, with some data. So it lies somewhere in between half-filled and filled stripes, maybe closer to half-filled than filled. Um, and its doping dependence doesn't seem to be special to one-eighth doping. It uh, seems to be there for uh, doping even up to 20, 20 odd percent or so. So uh, um, this is for spin. And of course, for charge, if we compare to the work that's been done at looking at charge order, then of course we have a different story compared to both the, the doping dependence as well as to the observation or lack thereof from the quantum Monte Carlo of charge order appearing at where one sees charge order uh, from uh, X-ray measurements and other, other measurements. Okay, so turning to, to superconductivity um, from quantum Monte Carlo, it was well known from a long time ago that uh, in three band and in single band, the dominant pairing occurs in the dx squared minus y squared channel. And we could look at that in the, for the pair field susceptibility, which is a uh, time integrated delta delta dagger expectation value. So we could look at that by itself, or we could look at the, the superconducting vertex, which just takes away the u equal to zero piece of it. Um, and so this is very uh, old work, uh, uh, which showed that D wave, uh, DX squared minus Y squared is the, the uh, dominant uh, symmetry. And of course, uh, this plot, uh, I think, has got us all very excited uh, many years ago, which showed from DCA, that is one uh, changes the cluster size uh, used in DCA for U equal to four, that one over the pair field susceptibility appear, appears to hit zero at a finite value of, uh, uh, of temperature on the order of, well, 20%, uh, 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 I'm sorry, 0 0.02 of the, of the hopping T. So small values of T, but given T is on the order of a quarter of a volt or so, these are pretty decent uh, uh, numbers. Um, so, uh, but let me show you the determinant quantum Monte Carlo. So not, not DCA uh, and just show how far we can, we can get by showing you the temperature evolution of the pair field susceptibility, uh, D wave projected pair field susceptibility. So here you could see for a wide range of, of doping, the pair field susceptibility grows as one decreases temperature um, for, for all doping. 
And in fact, the pair field susceptibility just increases off of half filling and there's no non-monotonic uh, behavior. It just seems to continue to go up uh, with the largest being at 25% uh, uh, doping. Um, so uh, that's for the pair field. If you look at the vertex, which takes away the U equal to zero piece, then you see uh, again, encouragement that, that as one goes to larger beta or lower, lower temperatures, um, it becomes more and more negative, which is what you're, you're looking for for superconductivity indicating an attractive interaction, uh, both for three band and, and single band. Um, and for the temperatures that we can access, we don't get to when this uh, vertex gets to be much larger. So we can't ascertain that we're going into a, a superconducting state, although the indications look like they're positive. Uh, but uh, the largest value of the vertex is occurring at around half filling. And uh, I didn't show it here, but the value, when you change values of, of U, you find the U of four is better than U of uh, eight or U of 12. Um, so that there is a strong dependence on U uh, and a much weaker dependence on, on T prime, at least for, for uh, these simulations that I'm showing. Um, and so uh, now I'm going to go into the issue of other phases uh, connected with superconductivity and antiferromagnetism uh, beyond stripes. So one of them is the pair density waves, which has been pointed out as being uh, practically degenerate with uniform D wave and other stripe phases from IPEP simulations. And there are many different forms that the uh, a putative pair density wave can, can uh, take. So I'm just going to show you um, evidence from simulations about whether one sees a pair density wave. First, let me show you the uh, pair field correlations, delta I, delta J in real space. So you can see um, this is from Quantum Monte Carlo uh, data that you do have a, a very nice local D wave pattern going from this reference bond here and then it de decays. Uh, we don't have truly long range uh, order, but then you have to look over in these corners or over on the sign to see whether or not this pattern inverts or flips or has a sign change. And at least for the level of data that we have, we don't see any overall sign change of the, the D wave pattern. And so we can put that in momentum space by looking at this Fourier transform. So I'll plot the pair field uh, uh, susceptibilities is a function of momentum Q, and I'll show you a little movie, um, uh, which is just plotting this for different doping and for, for different temperatures. So here uh, at large temperatures beta of one or the temperature on the order of T um, is a very, very weak peak at around Q equal to zero. I'm just plotting along Q along the, the, the bond direction. And uh, as one cools down, you see that the peak intensity grows, but there's no signature of anything that's happening out at any other uh, uh, momentum point, meaning Q equal to zero, uh, we see seems to be the most uh, dominant contribution to the pair field susceptibility. Of course, we're limited by a resolution of the, the, of the cluster size that we can would look at. And, and uh, I'm not, I can't say anything of what may happen down at lower temperatures, but at least on the temperature scales in which we can see fluctuating stripes and an increase in superconducting uh, order, there's no sign of uh, anything happening out at, uh, out at uh, uh, finite, uh, finite Q. Um, but I, I think that this, of course, is still an open open matter. Is pointed out that that there are models where you can stabilize a pair density wave. So it's a, a interesting topic to continue to look for. Um, looked at uh, a, a number of people have looked besides uh, us at uh, other type of uh, orders involving bond currents um, in different way shapes or forms, or well as magnetism, which may involve oxygen. <clears throat> and uh, un unfortunately, whether one looks at DMRG or DQMC on, on clusters, uh, sizable clusters in three band or in single band Hubbard model, uh, the uh, loop current order is there locally, but it dies off, it's small, but it, and it dies off within a plaquette or two. 
Um, and you could look at the parameter choices and you can understand which parameters help or hurt having loop current uh, order both in DQMC and uh, DMRG. But uh, I think there's been quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of searching from these two methods for this type of order, and it just always seems to be small and exponentially decaying. So, and I don't have time to go to in all of the the details, but happy to discuss this or in the question section or any of it for that matter. Um, and uh, likewise, there's been a lot of effort looking for pneumatic uh, order, and this is uh, encouraging that there's a very strong increase in the B1G pneumatic susceptibility, that's chi prime as a function of temperature plotted here uh, for different values of, uh, of doping. So uh, there is a, a, a strong rise as one goes down to lower temperatures, it's uh, not prevalent, as prevalent as in B2G or a different type of pneumatic susceptib susceptibilities. And in fact, it's even non-monotonic that there seems to be a peak if you just extract a Curie temperature from this of somewhere around 10% uh, uh, doping. Uh, and so I think that, that all of these type of orders have a tendency to be present within the Hubbard model. It's just the degree of strength of whether ones are short range or long range or the, the uh, size of the overall order one sees. So the bottom line in terms of stripes and superconductivity, I think that there are a lot of results now we'll all, all generally agree on stripes being a very dominant uh, feature in the low energy behavior of the, of the Hubbard model uh, ground state, as well as finite temperatures, at least when temperatures get on the scale of about uh, J, that spin stripes seem to persist up to that uh, uh, temperature. And there are many different types of stripe phases that can occur with different modulations, which seem to be controlled largely by uh, T prime as at least the dominant, uh, the dominant control factor. Yet I think we're seeing that the superconducting correlations are there and they have long range uh, or quasi long range uh, order, at least when T prime is turned on, that at best they coexist with stripe order and they never seem to prevail uh, all by themselves. So the single band and three band results seem to give results which are consistent with each other in these uh, above mentioned four points. So the summary for this particular uh, part, again, the three band and single band Hubbard model um, seem to show the same low energy uh, pro uh, properties. And there are a lot of things that the Hubbard model gets right in terms of connection to the cuprates. Um, in terms of the uh, what, at half filling and the spectral weight transfer I've, I've already uh, mentioned and the suppression of antiferromagnetic magnetic uh, long range order with doping yet preserving short range striped uh, anti magnetic correlations um, and the prevalence of all types of stripe order that go along with superconductivity and the fact that, that it truly, the superconducting pair state truly is uh, dominant dx squared minus y squared and most importantly, that there are extremely rich number of intertwined states at, at low energies. So all of these things is telling us that the ingredients do go a long way to giving us uh, quite a lot of aspects that compare favorably uh, with the cuprates. Um, but on the most important aspect, the, the issue of high temperature superconductivity at intermediate coupling, I say that uh, I would say that the jury is still still out. Um, uh, but of course, I think that uh, going to larger leg ladders, six leg la ladders to address this issue of plaquette pairing or quasi 1D versus 2D is really the right way to go. And of course, um, if we can see uh, uh, evidence from uh, TC stabilized on the order of 10% or, 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 or even uh, 0.02 of uh, the hopping T, then we would be certainly quite happy about that but we're blocked by the fermion sign to be able to address that. So in the last part then, um, I can't tell in terms of what I'm doing for time. Um, looks like uh, I'll try to just finish up uh, quickly. I just want to discuss two aspects of transport, which as I said at the beginning, these are very easy to measure. And so uh, one's been bathed in wonderful data for many, many years uh, to try to characterize the so-called strange metal or not so normal phase above, uh, above the superconducting transition. So 
There are two aspects that I'm going to address, which is calculations of the resistivity and calculation of the Hall effect and see how far Boltzmann-like picture can get us in understanding properties of, uh, of transport. So uh, I see there are there questions. I see there's uh, hands raised. Were there questions? Uh, no one is raising hands. No, no one. Okay. All right. So here, what, what we do is we calculate a current current correlation function, which lives in Matsubara frequency or imaginary time. And to get it to, to uh, give us a conductivity, we have to do what's called analytic continuation. That's using maximum entropy to be able to do that. Um, and uh, as you know, maximum entropy is a bit like a black box. However, you know, we can be fairly confident by doing many, many checks that the results we're getting are at least on grand scales uh, uh, can be trusted. So here are plots of the uh, sigma of omega versus uh, 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 frequency for three different values of doping, a uh, half filling on the left-hand side, 10% in the middle, 20% on the, on the right. For uh, hot temperatures, which is the dashed or dotted lines uh, down to cold temperatures as far as we can get, which is the solid blue line. So on the left-hand side, you can see you have a gap as you go to low temperatures, meaning the spectral weight depletes at low energies and it piles up to uh, the absorption peak, which is a little bit below the Hubbard peak, which, is, uh, which should be at six, uh, 6 T for these simulations. Um, so indicative of it being an insulator. But as soon as one dopes, you could see you get a Druda peak that, uh, that appears at low, at low frequencies and that Druda peak continues to grow as you come down in, in temperatures and its width seems to be a little bit narrower as you go from 10% to, to 20%. And if you look at the high frequency uh, end or at temperatures on the order of T or greater, it's largely doping uh, independent. And in fact, the peaks can scale together in, in temperature uh, at these values. So uh, if I just plot one over that DC value to give a value of the resistivity, here's a, a broad window in, in temperature for uh, different dopings up to 30% doping. And of course, at very, very high temperature, given we have a finite band, it's not a surprise that rho should go linearly with T. That's what the dashed lines are, are there. And then of course, at very, very low temperatures at half filling, it's an insulator. So the resistivity blows up as the gap opens up. Um, but what is remarkable is the fact that there really is no dramatic change in temperature dependence going down uh, uh, to low temperatures from the high temperature behavior as long as one gets away from, from half filling. So if we blow that up on the, on the right-hand sign, that over a very large temperature regime, you see that the resistivity goes roughly uh, uh, linear. Um, and of course, this is plotted in unit, natural units of h bar over e squared. So uh, all of these values are exceeding the Mott-Yaffe limit. Um, uh, as a typical signature of the uh, fact that these are extremely bad metals. Um, and so you can analyze the, the data by looking, uh, comparing the resistivity to the compressibility, which no analytic continuation is needed or plotting one over the compressibility. Again, that's not a surprise that it's linear temperature at high temperatures, um, and, but it persists and comes down uh, and, and uh, linearly with temperature, but it comes at a finite value as T goes to, to zero. So the fact that the resistivity is going all the way down linear in temperature is dominated by chi at least, or one over chi, at least at higher temperatures, but at low temperatures, something uh, else kicks, kicks in. And of course, by Einstein relation, that is the diffusivity or one of the diffusivity which goes from being roughly constant at, at high temperature to something which goes like uh, uh, linear with T or at least uh, uh, strongly uh, going to zero as T approaches, uh, uh, approaches zero. So we see the, the linear and T dependence is it really involves a trade-off between the compressibility and the diffusivity. 
and gives the apparent uh, continuation from low temperatures all the way down to, to high temperatures. And uh, I think this was shown in uh, Antoine's uh, talk that, that this type of behavior can be measured uh, in a cold atom system and diffusivity uh, shows exactly this behavior of having a, a temperature dependent or constant value at larger temperatures, which grows with decreasing temperature or one over the diffusivity, which de decreases as temperature goes, goes down the compressibility, uh, uh, giving, giving the resistivity that's shown on the left-hand side, which can compares favorably with uh, uh, dynamical mean field theory and the quantum Monte Carlo that I, that I showed, as well as finite temperature uh, Lanchos method. So this is exciting. It gives us a good way of at least looking at systems which we would expect to be more connected to the Hubbard model than, than maybe the Kuprits. Um, and so uh, let me just then close with the Hall coefficient uh, to just to show you that it is difficult to calculate, although it's easy to measure. And there are three different approaches that one can, can take in calculating the Hall coefficient. One is just to put in a magnetic field and run your quantum Monte Carlo uh, with the magnetic field. There's nothing wrong to do that. You're allowed to do it in the algorithm. Your code just becomes complex, but it's uh, straightforward to do. The other, so that's valid for any magnetic field. The other is uh, to just the zero field limit, uh, which means evaluating a three current correlation function and plot that as a function uh, of, uh, of temperature. Uh, and then the third one is to use a method that Asa Auerbach has discussed uh, that we've checked out, which is doing an expansion in terms of these uh, Liouvillian matrix elements and measuring it to leading order which involves uh, moments of the magnetization with the, with the current. So we've done all three of these um, and can show that in fact, all three give similar results as B goes to zero, magnetic field goes to zero. So I'm just gonna be showing you the one set of results, um, which is the Hall coefficient here plotted um, uh, from quantum Monte Carlo for uh, four different fillings, starting at uh, uh, half filling. Uh, there's no T prime in this, so we have particle hole symmetry at half filling. So the Hall coefficient is dead zero for mu of four, eight, 12, and 16 for all temperatures. And then as one dopes, one sees uh, that in fact, the Hall coefficient becomes temperature dependent. And in fact, depends on, on you. Uh, and if you is small, the uh, Hall coefficient is roughly or less temperature dependent, but as U gets uh, larger uh, on the order of 12 or six, 16 T, in fact, it goes like, uh, or the Hall coefficient increases as temperature decreases, and in fact can change sign. Can change sign not just once, but twice as it, as it does here of U of 12 at 5% doping or here at 10% doping for, for U of 12. Um, and so, uh, and of course, uh, at large temperature, uh, the Hall coefficient doesn't know uh, about the, the correlation. So in fact, uh, that's this dotted line here that the non-interacting value is obtained. And then generally it tends to uh, increase if U is bigger than four going off of the non-interacting uh, value. And as I said, can even change sign. <clears throat> And for our case, it collapses as you go to half filling because we don't have T prime turned on. So uh, uh, this is not the standard behavior that one sees in, uh, in Fermi liquids. And, uh, but yet you can still try to analyze it the same way by looking at the Fermi surface. So here's a proxy for the Fermi surface. It's the uh, uh, electron green function taken at imaginary time a beta over two and the limit that temperature goes to zero. This is a good mimic for the intensity <clears throat> of the spectral function at the Fermi surface. And so what I'm plotting is uh, here is for different values uh, of U of four, eight, 12 and 16 uh, and one particular doping. Uh, the bare Fermi surface is given by these pink, pink dots. So of course, as U gets small, the, temp, the Fermi surface matches matches up more closely with the uh, the non-interacting one, but.
But as one increases the value of U, we go from being closed at a, a Fermi surface closed around gamma to one being closed uh, around uh, pi pi. And that's the, uh, the crosses here are showing the peak of the spectral function um, uh, going along different uh, uh, for all of the momentum that we get access in the cluster. And so if you look as U changes going from being centered around pi around zero zero to be centered around pi pi, the point at which that Fermi surface changes its topology is exactly the point where the Hall uh, coefficient changes its sign. So we even know that we have a very uh, uh, bad metal, strange metal, whatever you, you would like to call it, uh, and very large values of U, this way of thinking in terms of the Fermi surface seems to hold up that the topology of the Fermi surface gives us a good way of determining the, at least the sign of the Hall coefficient. So that brings me to the end of the end of the talk. Um, I've already said the top uh, two bullets in terms of a final uh, summary, um, just in terms of the last bullet and of transport of the Hub Hubbard model definitely has strange metal uh, uh, behavior with smooth evolution of resistivity and no sign of saturation. And at least, uh, and the Hall coefficient being very distinctly non-Fermi liquid-like, but still being able to be linked by the Fermi surface. So let me just then uh, put up my collaborators and thank you for paying attention. Uh, thanks, Tom, for a very great talk. Yeah, so uh, any questions? Daniel, yes, I see you have a hand raised. Or I'm not, I'm not the moderator, somebody else is the moderator. Uh, okay, uh, you already gave my name. Okay, I, I have a question about the whole coefficient. Uh, do we have any simple uh, physical explanation why it, did, it does change at high temperature? And the second question in connection, this uh, large interaction, a large U, how does it behave at a uh, very high doping? You should probably all again change sign to from positive to negative. That's and right. How, yeah, it, like, it, it, do, do you see it? And yes. at uh, which concentration would it happen? Yes, so it, and as, as U gets cranked up, uh, you see the sign change persist uh, out to larger and larger doping, absolutely. Um, uh, the, uh, I don't have plots of, uh, of that to, to show you. Um, so yeah, I, I think one is what is seeing the, the double sign changes because you're seeing spectral weights starting to pile up. Whoop, I'm sorry. Here you can see that the, the G of K of tau beta over two is quite broad. And so, uh, you know, the, the peak is very, the, the crosses are pretty uh, uh, ill-defined. At least uh, there's a wide range of momentum where you might uh, try to draw that, that, that peak. So I think what you're seeing is as the spectral weight starts piling up closer and closer to the Fermi level as temperature gets lowered, that there is an evolution, still an evolution of the Fermi surface that is happening. And I don't have a, a, you know, a, a, a nice two sentence explanation for why, the, why it should change sign, but that's just apparently what, uh, how, it, how it evolves from the simulation. Maybe simply at very high temperatures, uh, the very notion of Fermi surface is not so well defined. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm insisting that I'm connecting to the Fermi surface, even though I, I shouldn't be doing that at very large temperatures. But and, uh, once again, at, at low temperatures, at uh, large U, but very high doping, at which doping should it change sign? Uh, I'd have to get back to you uh, uh, in the actual number, uh, what the number uh, is, but... Um, it, in very naive uh, picture, like if you simply compare intensity of say uh, uh, electron addition, electron uh, removal spectrum in the style of Zawadzki, for example, then it should be at about uh, 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 two thirds doping or one third, whatever. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, in terms of the entropy, yes. Uh, uh, I so remember do, do we you, did look do, at that. Do, do you reproduce these results? Uh, do, do, uh, your calculation, do they agree with these simple estimates or not? I, it, I, again, I'm scratching my memory on that. I don't have a figure to show you, but I'm tended to, to, to uh, say yes, but I have to go back and uh, show you the data to be convinced. Okay, very good, thanks. Yeah, thank you.
Lev, uh, you to ask now. Uh, hi. Um, so you, you mentioned a number of behaviors that are um, uh, at least strongly affected by T prime. Um, is there much of a sense of uh, which behaviors T prime does affect strongly and also um, how it depends on the sign? Because it seems like the sign of T prime does change uh, quite a lot, you know, whether stripes appear and so on. So is, is there much of a sense of why that's the case and what behaviors it controls? Well, uh, I, I think it changes everything. I think uh, T prime uh, certainly um, changes the behavior near, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, near pi zero and spectral functions and Van Hove points and locations and so on. Um, but uh, uh, that, that is what you'd expect. I think the thing that's uh, much more interesting is its, it, its effect on the uh, longer range, on long range order, it's certainly affecting the uh, period of the stripes and by either direct connection to superconductivity itself or indirect via modulating the charge density uh, uh, wave is, is affecting superconductivity. Um, uh, so I, I think that, that uh, you know, it's a, it's a loaded statement, but it seems of all the parameters of that one, one can tune, it's the one which has the most impact mm -hmm. on both spectroscopy as well as long, longer range order. Uh -huh. But is, is there much of a sense as to why that in particular, or is there any kind of like unifying thread as to yeah, so, so you know, this, the, if you change the sign of T, for example, then you encourage running on the same magnetic sublattice, for example. And so, so I mean, I think that that is uh, um, the T prime positive versus negative uh, uh, part, of, part of it that, I, you know, is a very simple way of uh, characterizing the, you know, not scrambling the magnetic environment. Uh, but in terms of the period of the stripes, and uh, I, I mean, you're, you're clearly affecting the magnetic uh, properties, but they're showing up as changes in the, the charge stripes as well. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, please. Um, hi, Tom. Um, you sh the resistivity that you showed uh, was bigger than H over E squared, even down at low temperatures. Uh, but experimentally, to the cube rates, it seems to be well below <coughs> H, over e, H over E squared. So yeah, is that because you're not at low enough temperatures or what, what is the reason for the difference? Yeah, yeah, certainly we're not at low enough temperatures. Uh, uh, the, the plot dies at uh, beta over, uh, um, when Where's a good in, uh, inset, the low energy one here. So we can get down to beta five. Um, and so in fact, it even looks like uh, it's coming into a constant value, uh, which it can, it, of course it cannot. And so here is the problem that we're running into in terms of uh, having a Druda peak that gets very, very sharp. And uh, if I go back to the optical conductivity here, and this becomes a problem for us for analytic continuation. You have the, the worst scenario, which is a sharp peak coexisting with a broad background. And so when temp, once the Druda peak gets on the order of temperatures of KBT or smaller, um, we have difficulties of uh, reliably uh, uh, extracting, uh, e extracting the same type of analysis that we did at larger values of the or Druda width. So the fact that it does look like it's coming down and hitting, uh, hitting or extrapolating the finite values at zero temperature is, is just a sign that the Druda peak is getting to be KBT. The width is getting to be a KBT. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Anas, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just uh, wondering, how, so the, the, the cup rates as uh, I read, it's, it's maybe had some inhomogeneity, like special inhomogeneities. Um, so why, why is not incor incorporated uh, directly in the, in the Hubble model? I mean, it's so, so the Hubble model is, uh, it's a model which says homogeneous. Uh, so so it, do, it doesn't reflect the, 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 the inhomogeneities that the, People see people see in the in the uh, in the cup rates. Right. 
No, of course. I mean, the, the Hubbard model, I mean, we do, I think it gets a lot further than you even would have thought at the beginning because it's the simplest possible model that you can cook, cook up. Um, there are many things that you could add, long range interaction disorder, uh, the lattice uh, uh, that we, you know are important to get the overall materials aspect of, of, uh, of, of the cuprates. So uh, yeah, of course your, your, your statement is true. And uh, uh, so, you know, I think that is really kind of a, a, a marching order going forward is which of all of the things that you would want to add are the most important to add. Um, uh, we had to work quite a lot, a lot just on the simple model um, to just ascertain basic sort of questions. And, and it is a, a very important thing going forward. Um, to discuss other ingredients and and you know in homogeneity is certainly there and I think that that's a, it could be a very important aspect that that uh, needs to be more seriously considered. If I answered your question correctly, or I mean I understood your question correctly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, is there any other question? Okay, uh, if there is no further question, uh, let's thank uh, Tom again. Uh, Tom, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. All right, thank you.